Evening everyone, welcome season two, episode three. Coming up in tonight's episode, we meet Joe Gross from head office at United Synagogue. We meet Rabbi Leitner from United Synagogue in Kinloss. And we meet Dime Simons. Rabbi Freeman asks him various shilas pertaining to Yom Kippur this year. That's right. Uh, as we gearing up in the 10 days of repentance, you know, it's uh, we're mm. trying to get you all prepared into the mode. Hope you had a nice Rosh Hashanah. Uh, how was yours, Rabbanit? It's amazing. Uh, it was very inspirational. It was. So many different yeah. services to choose from seeing uh, the different people come in and out um, it was non-stop it was a marathon one after the other yeah um each service obviously couldn't be oversubscribed but all together there were a lot of people there amazing team okay yeah there's a lot I of mean, teamwork from team. mark go i think we you know i think the shul was actually the safest place to be you know the way mm. you know with socially distanced wearing the masks you know being outdoors in the marquee you felt you know people are scared to come but it's really you're safe, better off in shul than in Mark and Spencer, I will say that. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Other supermarkets are available. I mean, the, the safety measures that were put in, I think it was really unbelievable. And everybody came in at different times. And yeah. um, it was really, really It amazing. worked, you know, with security, <clears throat> the wardens, the chazonim, the rabbis, it was, the rebbitsons. It was, yeah, full full day. And then afterwards, we did all the chauffeur blowings. That was like, oh, <laughs> basically yeah. until Mincha. I think somebody said, you know, I didn't go to shul, but I... Definitely heard more chauffeur blowing this year than any other. Yeah, you just good. walked around the suburb and you were able to... It was really nice because we did it from our balcony and over the hour that we set aside for that, we had about 200 people come past. Not a one go, um, not. small groups of six, all socially distanced. And it was amazing how people, people have not seen for months, they came out to hear. It was yeah. really special. Then we went round and so, you know, we had a few requests to go to people's houses. But when you're standing out there blowing... Then the neighbours come out, oh, how lovely, then, oh, can you just knock on to my parents? And we're, like, we're out for like, hours doing it, then we had to come to shul for a minute. Did you, get to, did you manage lunch, to squeeze in lunch in between? We got time? lunch, yeah, well, uh, right. the hours we did on the balcony was between the soup and the main course. Oh. Then we came back, we had the pickled tongue and the lamb, it was lovely. And then I fell asleep at the table, about oh. half an hour, had dessert, and then I was out till the rest of the until until Mincha, then Nishia, then Marib. Came home and had early night, and then sleep at six thirty this morning. So yeah, non-stop. Uh, but you know we're, we're not done yet. We've still got Yom Kippur coming up, and the wardens again are, are working hard to make sure that works. Based on the tremendous success we had over Rosh Hashanah, um, it worked really well. It's um, really amazing, you know, the the different guidelines that we have. You know, it's it could could be confusing to some. It works. It works. It definitely works. It definitely works. I mean, yeah, as, as you'll know by now, we've got a book in for services for track and trace. There's a one way system in shul. We're wearing masks. We're not singing in the building. We're keeping socially distant. So we're keeping all the rules and it works. It did feel a bit strange, you know, leading the service to what looked a bit like an empty shul um, and people not singing, you know, parts of the davening you lead up for people to respond and you're not getting that. Right. Uh, so really it's hard hard. to work on those leading the services, um, but it worked. It worked. And so I caught up with uh, Joe Gross, a communities and strategies director of United Synagogue before Rosh Hashanah, um, just to give us a little bit of the guidelines and understanding about these like track and trace. So let's let's hear what she had to say. Welcome, Joe, to Norris Lee TV. Thank you very much. It's as close as I can get to the shul these days. So thank you. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time and um, more specifically your your um, efforts in really, you know, during this all the way from the beginning of lockdown. And I know I know presently um, working in the details of all the government guidelines and the United Synagogue guidelines. It's it's um, I hope you had some holiday <laughs> in between. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Because <laughs> I'm sure it was nonstop. So thank you for all the work that you do. So um, I just thought we'd, you know, now we're coming to, um, we had just uh, celebrated, you know, um, Rosh Hashanah, and now we're up to um, getting to Yom Kippur. And, you know, we just wanted to just ensure that we had the guidelines, you know, clear to us and see how um, we, you know, make sure we have an understanding of what it actually meant that we, you know, coming to shul and staying home. So one of the major differences is, is actually davening in the building versus outside. 
can you talk with us and you know sing like we're allowed to sing outside in the marquee with and we don't have to wear the mask but indoors um it's a whole different ball game can you speak to that a little bit no that's absolutely right so um wherever you are according to united clinical guidelines whether you are indoors or outdoors you're required to social distance so for each each person or each bubble which is a household or support bubble to be two meters apart but indoors everybody is required to wear a face covering unless you are leading the service and are a particular distance specific distance away from everybody um and the or whilst the husband can sing the rest of the Kahila, the rest of the congregation, to use the government's words, um, can't sing outdoors. Um, as long as everyone's socially distanced, and particularly as, as long as everyone isn't facing one another, but we don't do that, we don't kind of dabble in a circle, um, then there's no need for a face covering or, and everybody can sing. Right. So, right, so even with the face covering, we, we, we can sing in the show. No, and there has been research that was published probably about three weeks ago, which does show that actually the risk of singing at a low volume is no higher really than talking at a low volume. However, um, because the government must make a call looking at all of its places of worship and all of its settings, it hasn't allowed um, even low volume congregational singing to return. So no, only the chazan and the rest of us will have to respond in our minds. In a, hum in a humming sign, right? Very uh, difficult times, right? Um, you know, I, I know um, some are concerned about or didn't want to come to shul because of this whole track and trace. You know, that uh, once they go to shul and they, they're fine, but when they come home and find out that somebody um, had COVID, or, um, do that mean they have to isolate for two weeks now and not send their kids to school and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I understand that's real anxiety and it's anxiety about lots of settings, as you say, for schools, that it's really kind of informing the, uh, the way that we live our lives. Um, we've worked really closely with Public Health England and with the local public health um, teams on this. So the message is quite clearly, as long as all the shul, the shul is complying with the guidance, as long as people are staying those that two meters away and wearing face coverings, it's very unlikely that many people will need to self-isolate. If an individual has been in contact with, and here that means within two meters for more than for 20 minutes or more, um, then that, that contact would need to um, self-isolate. What we have been, we have written some guidance on it, it's online so people can see. We have, in no way are we uh, kind of replacing Public Health England advice, we're certainly not um, public health advisors in any way, but we recognise there's a bit of a challenge over, over the hugging um, and communication because we can't pick up the phones to the public health teams or members can't look online. So we have added another precaution, which is to say that let's say on first day hug, um, someone late, went to shul in the morning and then later in the afternoon developed symptoms, we'd ask that they get the message to shul. And I think what we'd say is not only will we try to find out who was in contact with them in that 20 minute, two, meeting, two meter kind of criterion, but also find out who was two meters around them. So effect effectively, if you think about a shul block, who was in their block? And we'd probably ask those people not to return to shul till after hug when we can confirm that they also don't need to self-isolate. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful because I know, like you said, a lot of people don't want to come to show because of that reason. And um, knowing that, you know, I mean, so far, though, thank God the show has been cleared um, and, and nobody has had it. So, so the social distancing actually does um, work. And I think like you mentioned in the beginning, it's really the key um, to, to, to staying safe everywhere, not only in show, but wherever we go to have that, that social distance measure. So it's, it's quite important. I mean, uh, so seeing the government guidelines and, uh, and on the website, you know, so many people, is, it's amazing uh, to see the details. And, you know, you know someone, um, you know, joked that it was just missing the, de it was just missing the detail of which direction we should, sh we should start with when we, sh when we shake the Arab Amin, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so many different opinions, but um, really, how did, how did they get all these, details of the mitzvah, of, you know, throughout all of all the Yom Tovim. 
Intuition. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I think it is fascinating. I think the first thing to say is it was a super smart move by the faith team, um, because um, who I'm not, you know, there have been iterations of this places of worship guidance that have come out over the last few months, and I'm not sure how many of our members or how many Jewish people in the community read them. Write something this specific, including things about. I mean, my kids thought the reference to sukkah crawls, for example, was hilarious. Write something like this, and everybody saw it in an instant. So super, super smart move. Um, obviously, we, we and particularly the Office of the Chief Rabbi, have been liaising with government all the way through, and the Chief Rabbi and his office sit on the Places of Worship Task Force, so, and they have seen our guidance. So it is a kind of iterative, iterative process, but I should say this was drafted internally. It was drafted internally, and wow. um, uh, the individual civil servants, yeah, who, who knew what they were doing. Yeah, it's I mean, it's amazing. You know, they didn't even have to translate Minion or <laughs> or, or Opera Minion for that matter. So it was really, really fascinating. A real, uh, I think, Kiddush Hashem. So uh, Yeshikov, for all the work that you do and in, in, in Office of the Chief Rabbi. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of um, talk about the Garden Minion. Um, you know, a lot, you know, started, the, the, the idea was really because they, they felt it was safer um, to be in the garden as opposed to coming to the shul. And, and some councils have um, shut it down. Well, it, it's not across the board. So is it the government allows for Garden Minyanim? Is it exclusive to different um, areas? This is really complex. It is quite complex. And I should say at the outset that kind of, I don't know, we, we find ourselves in a really diff different situation. <laughs> so up until now, and so up until quite recently, the government put out guidance, we chatted to them about it, and then with the help of our Dianim and rabbis and lay leaders, we translated it into guidance that fitted our context. So one central message from government and one message from the United Synagogue, and that was applicable to all its communities. Now there is a kind of a, a divergence of views, if you like, and whilst and different directors of public health in each borough are making slightly different judgments and they're interpreting the guidance, the most recent guidance differently. So your members will all have seen, I'm sure, the letter that came up from Barnett's local public health uh, director and, um, and yes, and that does mean really unfortunately for Norris Lee that um, the Garden Minyanim aren't allowed. There are, um, public health directors in other areas that have read it differently. But I think it's more than that. It's that they're making a judgment based on their demographic. They're looking at what is safe and it isn't safe. As one um, director said to me, no, I'm really concerned about people going out on a Saturday night in pubs and clubs. That's my worry. And actually I'm far less concerned about a COVID secure prayer service outside. So what we've had to do is adapt our practice according to um, where we live. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And I guess in, the case, in our case, because of the situation and I guess the rise that we didn't, Absolutely. I mean, recognizing that, you know, they, they are even, they were under the auspices of the shoal. So they were COVID secure. They, they were smaller numbers. They were social distancing. And yet, I guess due to the rise of cases that they had to shut down, which was... Uh, That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And, yeah. and I hope that it will return as well. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. I mean, we had to do an early minion now, 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> right That's coming. Right you have your whole, whole, whole day ahead of you. Um, yeah, now with the new rule of six, that affected the chauffeur blowing as well, right? Um, the fact that we weren't allowed to uh, be have a communal... Uh, chauffeur blowing in, in the park with more than six people. So that looked more, you know, that had, you know, it was, it was, it was that you, I think you refer to it as the NHS, NHS clapping. Um, yeah, so that's right. So we, you know, we did give a few options um, for that. So I think, um, sorry, I'm just, I'm just making sure that, yes, yeah, so actually you can, it would have been possible to have done something in a public space in Barnet. Um, but uh, you did, the community did need to get risk assessments in. And I do have to say, it's extraordinary how, extraordinary how quickly Jews can do administration and fill out forms and get things done when they want to. And there are now tons of alternative sites and, and activities happening um, because they got those risk assessments into Barnet quickly. Um, wow. Yeah, whereas what does, with that mean? what does that mean exactly? They're able to... Um, have a space like a, a I, I saw something about a car park if they were in a car yeah, park so, so, like so 
That's right. So I think the public health directors will prefer it if communities rented out space in, let's say, a community centre car park, a school field, a car park of a public building, which is a COVID secure site. And then within that, you have a, everybody is socially distanced, as you would do anyway. And and communities had to fill out a risk assessment to make that happen. Um, and, so, and some communities have done that. Um, there is an alternative which some communities do, which is yes, along the clap for carers uh, kind of model, which is that each house where it's a very Jewish area, where it's acceptable, where it wouldn't be a Chilod Hashem, where people would accept it, that people should stand in, that people could stand in their household groups and the chauffeur could be playing on the street. And that way we're able to bring it to people's homes, even if we can't allow them to gather together. Or to do it in the show as well as we did, you know, to, yeah, to go yeah. and, and with socially distance. And I think with the show part, it's the three meter, right? You have to, you have to be at least three meters apart, right? Um, the chauffeur blower has to be three meters, but everybody else can just That's be two meters. Two meters, yeah. right, right, yeah, right. And then that that really stopped the communal tashla from happening yeah. as well. But I guess that would. I mean, with that, if they did administrative work papers of fill out, they could also. But I guess you needed a stream near. So actually, this is where we came in more cautious on this because we felt from our experience of these events that actually they're social events. The, it's not really about the personal tashlich, which you say yourself. <laughs> it's about seeing your friends and chatting and feeling part of something bigger. And we know Jews and we know our members, and it would be very difficult to manage an event like that in a COVID secure way. And even more so in a public area where everybody can see. And so soon after this rule has been introduced, um, plus there are security concerns sometimes. So uh, we decided this was the one that wasn't appropriate for this year, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for the amazing work that you do, the time and um, the details of, you know, I'm sure going through um, the, the amount of paperwork uh, that you had to go through and, and, and collecting. So, uh, you know, on behalf of the really, uh, the community, we really thank you. Um, and Rabbi Liss also um, is very much involved as well. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Rabbi Liss has been an absolute rock and I have learned so much about halacha from this process. Um, but really, I hope that you and um, the rabbi and all the rabbinic team and your members have a sweet new year. It's going to be very different this year, but I hope that it can be fulfilling in its own way. Right. To you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, for doing that. And thank you, Joe. That was yes. very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, not having a communal tashlach was, was, was quite uh, yeah. different. I mean, you, you, we saw people, you know, individually walk or couples or, you know, groups of only six go to the tashlach this year. Uh, but the treats, you know, chauffeur and treats to go, people did come to Shul to hear the chauffeur and, and get the treats to go. So it was a little... I haven't done tashlach myself yet. I was busy playing chauffeur all day. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, but uh, chauffeur, you can only do on Yontif. Right. Well, tashlach, you've got till a shana rubber. So That's we'll right. take the kids That's out one day somewhere nice. We'll make an outing out of it. There you go. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And uh, what do we have here in the studio? So here in the studio, ooh, sounding very professional here, uh, we have the United Synagogue's latest publications. Now, a lot of you will have received this in the post. Uh, I've not read it all, but I've perused it. Some fascinating, inspirational uh, content here about the Tefillot and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, and so if you are staying at home on Yom Kippur, well worth the read and even if you are going to shul it'll only be for short amounts of time so it's not like in previous years where often you're there all day or with a short break you'll be most of the time at home uh, and you ain't going to be eating much i hope and uh, yeah. so this is a very useful and valuable thing to do with your time on yom kippur which i shall be doing myself hopefully as well absolutely uh, so this was produced by rabbi leitner uh, from who Rabbi, one of the rabbis at Kinloss and uh, from head office as well. So Rabbi Freeman speaks to him about this publication. So let's have a listen to this now. Thank you. Rabbi Michael Leitner, what an honor and pleasure to have you here on Narasli TV. Uh, of course, you are no stranger, Narasli. This is your home, home turf. Yeah, it's a, a pleasure to be on Narasli TV. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, always nice to feel, uh, feel back on the home team. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, great to, to have you back in the suburb, at least virtually, because as many of our viewers would know, Rabbi Leitner grew up at Hampstead Gardens Synagogue, 
Uh, and such a such a pleasure always working alongside him and the support that that he offers uh, to Norris Lee has been amazing. But we know you wear a couple of hats. You're at Kinloss and at United Synagogue today. We're talking to you in your capacity as uh, United Synagogue. Um, what was your official title at United Synagogue? So I'm, I'm the rabbi of the Jewish Living Division, which is our educational and programming team. Okay, fabulous. And, and the output that you do generally and even under these trying circumstances is absolutely fabulous. So Yashika for supporting uh, all of the shuls, the rabbis and the work that you do. Today we're going to talk about a couple of key uh, projects that are going on right now. Most of our members should have received in the mail the Shana Tova Companion Guide. So Rabbi Leighton, would you tell us a little about how it came about and you know, what, what's in it uh, that our members should be anticipating? Okay, F thank you very much. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to discuss this. Um, we were thinking really about what the central output of the United Synagogue is, and it has three pillars. The first is to help shuls with things that they might not be able to do by themselves. The second is to help shuls with things which they do already, but perhaps there can be some additional value which can be given to that output already. And the third is to reach beyond our boundaries and to connect with people that might not necessarily connect with our communities or come into contact with them. And especially for this um, upcoming Yamim Nurayim, very unusual, difficult circumstances, we wanted to try and provide something by working together with Koran publishers, whom we have a fortunately very close relationship with, which we hoped would um, enable people, whether they are at home or in shul, to um, make more out of the Mahsor and more out of the days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur than they might have done otherwise. And that kind of became the, uh, the stimulus for the Shana Tovah book and copies of which, as you mentioned, have been sent to every US member around the country. Amazing. And, and what, what's in it? What is in the book that people should be looking out for and <clears throat> guiding them, them through the Yom Tov, especially if they are at home, how is the structure? What should they be doing? I know it's, in a, it's meant to accompany the master, but before, after, alongside, while one's taking breaks, how does it work? Yeah, it's a very good question. So as Rabbi Friedman showed you on the screen, this is the Shanat of our book. So it has a number of sections which are based um, primarily, but not exclusively, on our prayers. So, for instance, this one here is about Untane Tokef, one of the central prayers, of course, of the Musaf service on Rosh Hashanah, which can be recited whether you're at shul or, or in home. It's not one which depends on a, a minyan or a community service. And as hopefully you can see, um, we've reproduced part of the prayer along with some questions for consideration. And then on the next page, uh, we have a couple of articles which um, are there to amplify some of the themes of this prayer and which relate to the discussion questions as well. So you can either read the book um, as it comes, or perhaps you can take one of the essays and themes and discuss it over a of meal, uh, or you can read it um, alongside the davening, which you are doing if you want to try and explore some more of the themes of the davening. And there's also at the back um, a, uh, a tribe section in addition to the tribe materials for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, um, which has a number of articles and activities for both teenage readers and also um, for, for younger readers as well, which they can, they can do with their parents. So we hope it'll be a way to, so to speak, hold your hand through the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur period, both this year and in future years as well. It's designed with the same dimensions as the Koren Sachs Machs, so hopefully it will fit um, snugly on your shelf next to your Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur Machzorim. And we were particularly pleased to work together with Koren because it gave us access to their library and some, I think, very inspirational materials from their library, uh, particularly the story of, of Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, who was former chief rabbi of Israel, and Lahavdor ben Chaim Lachaim, his late brother Naftali Lau Lavi, one of the great unsung heroes of Israel's history. He's, featured in this book. And we're also grateful to local authors like Rafi Berg, who's the BBC's uh, online Middle East news editor, who wrote a fabulous book about the rescue of Ethiopian children. It's called Red Sea Spies. I'm sure some of you would have come across it. It's 
was the inspiration. Uh, we, did, for the we, we did a program, um, you know, about six weeks ago. Robinet did a program with oh. them. But yeah, fabulous. Well, very great Fantastic. take up on it. Yeah. So we were lucky. Very kindly allowed us to introduce uh, to include rather excerpts from his book as well. Excellent. Excellent. I see you've got some great articles by Sivan Rahab Meir, who joined us as yeah. well um, about a year ago. So you know, fabulous, fabulous work you've done. And you mentioned. Towards the end of the book, uh, there are some resources uh, from Tribe for various ages. I see you've got uh, Rev E featured. We're looking forward to having Rev E, Rabbi Kirby Abramoff, for our link service uh, for the young adults uh, in the marquee in the back. Uh, but tell us, uh, Tribe does superb work. Uh, tell us about some of the Tribe uh, materials that have come, that are appearing here, and independently because we were handing those out uh, to families on the farm bus but tell us for those who didn't receive it or haven't yet clicked on the links what's important there and why they should click and print it out before you answer. Yeah thank you. Um, so in this book the, the tribe um, articles are designed primarily for perhaps sitting around the table and having some discussion or activity or some, some quiet time in that sense. Uh, on the Tribe website, there are two sets of activities and I've got the front sheets of them. This is Tribe's guide for running a children's service at home. It can also obviously be used at Shul, but it's particularly pitched for those who are unable to bring children to Shul, unfortunately. And these are all on the front page of tribeuk.com. That's the, the Tribe website. And then uh, another resource pack, which is um, for teenagers, because adults can also use it, not just with teenagers, but by themselves. And these were um, put together by Rav E, of course, the fabulous educator who uh, you're, you're fortunate to have over the Abin Marayim, and also by Rabbi Eli Levy, uh, our tribe rabbi, and Rabbi Nikki Goldmeyer and Tamara Jacobson and our, our design team as well, who um, put a lot of effort into uh, making these resources happen. So I hope that you'll find them useful. And as um, it's wonderful, we've been distributing them to members already. And for those who don't have a copy, uh, can go to the Tribe website, tribeuk.com, and download and print out the pages that are relevant to you. Excellent, excellent. So while we are talking about going online, uh, I know the United Synagogue has a whole new initiative, uh, the US.tv. Tell us a little about that, and um, if I may, uh, I guess, give my own um, interest, uh, some of the work that the rabbis and rabbitsons have been uh, showing for the Amtovim on the US.tv. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really exciting initiative and we're delighted that uh, yourself and Batya and, uh, and also um, Ephraim are, are featured in the, the, some of the upcoming programming. So the, the US TV sprung out of those three kind of pillars of our work, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, providing things for shores that might not be able to do it themselves perhaps add, giving added value to things shuls already do and reaching out to the, the broader public as well. And um, the US TV is a, um, a very, I think, high quality site, and not just in terms of what it provides, but in terms of the way that it, it looks, which provides easy reference for finding all sorts of different programs. And our rabbis, Robertson's educators and communities are our primary source for this because they are fantastic places. And we want to do whatever we can to showcase what's going on in them and to hopefully open up their reach uh, beyond what it would normally be. So in particular, uh, one of the current programs we have uh, is a series of short videos for the Amim Noraim for the High Holy Days, where rabbis, rabbitsons and educators from across the United Synagogue community and, uh, and also some of our central departments uh, have each taken a, a short topic relating to uh, the Amim Noraim and have produced a video which you can see on the site. Uh, just a few minutes, just getting us some inspiration, learning a little bit more about it. And especially this year, for those who won't be able to go to shul, uh, or even for those who are in shul, where we can't give explanations during davening in the way that we normally would, this is an opportunity to be able to see some of those on the US.tv. And in addition, there are some magnificent recordings of the, the music of the, uh, the Amim Noraim period, which I think people can also enjoy and benefit from and learn from, um, around either side of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you, um, you know, throughout the United Synagogue's uh, website, 
Um, I, I'm davening for the first time this year here in this country leading chakras and to just be able to go on and check the right tunes for <clears throat> the United Synagogue Minhag and Minhag Anglia and it, it's just fabulous. I, I don't know of a website, a shul organization website in the world that parallels uh, what you have put together. So Yasha Koach, Thank you for everything, Rabbi Leitner. Thank you for your time today and always being so supportive. Thank you for everything that United Synagogue uh, does for our community and for Anglo Jewry. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to chat with you today. And uh, also thank you to Norris Lee for being such an incredibly vibrant and wonderful community and the, the amazing ideas that come out of it. I especially love you know, the, the bus you've got at the moment delivering goodies to people before Rosh Hashanah. What an amazing idea. And, and Bezrat Hashem in the year ahead, yourselves and the whole community should go from strength to strength and be blessed with all the things that we pray for for the good. Amen, amen. Well, thank you, Rabbi Friedman and Rabbi Leitner. That was uh, quite informative. It's, he seemed like he covered real, a real gamut between having tribe and um, yeah. all the different services in there with questions. So um, hopefully, you know, those who are staying at home will be able to use that. And even like you said, those who are even going to shul, there's plenty of time. Yeah. To, to or even this. in shul, you know, if you're a bit bored during the davening, that would never happen. No, 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 But it could happen. And we have Rab Rabbi Ibramov also gave a little bit of insight there. And we were, yeah. we were lucky, so lucky to have him take over the link. I mean, that link menu. The link menu is from that. For those who are not familiar, the link menu is um, our service we do for 18 to 30 year olds led by Joe Summerfield. Unbelievable. Um, the turnout was phenomenal. It was, and all the pe all the, the boys and the girls were involved in leading the service as well. It was something really, really special, really phenomenal. And many people came past just to view it, you know, we had right. like a viewing gallery. Yeah, um, but it was, and it was, and it was very interactive. Um, interactive. Like um, Rav, Rav e, you know, short known. speech of space throughout. Right. And because we were in the marquee for that service, they could sing with as well, familiar tunes. Which helped. Uh, the boys laned, the girls read out some of the prayers and did some of the speeches and the explanations. It was, they were involved, weren't just there, present. They were actually involved and took on leadership roles and they were empowered by that. It's something really, it's a highlight of the year for those, yeah, for that yeah, age. Yeah, it was a great success. Yeah. And, Yeshakar again to Joe and Rav E, who really uh, put a, a lot of work into it, and as well as yourself, Rabbi Guttentag. Well, I know you worked a lot behind the scenes, and uh, I couldn't really be there at the time. time because because all the other we had eight, eight services to <laughs> to run yeah. to, but you know you you're, you're yeah. very much um, uh, involved with the with that age group. So Yeshakar to you uh, as well on on doing that amazing work. And um, now, gearing up to Yom Kippur, uh, Rabbi Friedman meets with Diane Simons, who really guides us on, you know, it's going to be very different as to what, you know, do you have, if one has COVID or not, can they fast, should they be fasting, if they have symptoms. And so we hear from the Diane about how to proceed. Yeah, a reminder of Hilchot Yom Kippur, especially at this year. So yeah, Diane Simons, thank you. Welcome, Diane Simons, from the London based in to Narasli TV. Such an honor and a pleasure to have you here. We are. You, you know, these these are strange times uh, for everyone, and um, and we know how hard the London based in and the uh, office of the chief rabbi have been working to figure it all out as we get back into Shul for Yom Tov, uh, you know, huge Yashar Koach for uh, all the tiny nuances to make us able to be there uh, in Shul for Yom Tov. But a lot of people have questions as we approach Yom Kippur, particularly uh, regarding fasting, regarding any differences in this year's uh, approach to Yom Kippur and fasting amidst coronavirus. And so thank you, Diane Simons, for agreeing to come to Naras TV and share uh, um, your halachic uh, perspectives and wisdom on, on, on this question. So let's start with this. Um, if a person has coronavirus, they've tested positive, uh, obviously they're not going to come to shul, chas v'shalom, but they feel able to fast. Should they be fasting? Okay, firstly, Rabbi Feldman, thank you for giving me the honor of uh, addressing 
Norris League TV. It's really a it's, a shame. it's an unprecedented year. And please God, we'll all have a Kasim Kasim and Tova and a, a good Gabench Dior. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you're asking me, somebody who's been tested positive, he's a, he feels able to fast, should they? So I think the important point to understand, uh, we all know that somebody, sorry, can you, is that okay? Yes. We all know that somebody suffering from a life-threatening illness, um, there's no question about it that he shouldn't fast on Yom Kippur. We know that when there's a danger to life, all uh, eating Yom Kippur, desecrating the Shabbos is set aside to save life. But the important point is it's not only permitted to eat Yom Kippur des or desecrate Shabbos for that matter, but it's actually an obligation. It's an obligation one fulfills a biblical mitzvah, a biblical ob obligation when one eats on Yom Kippur to save one's life. The Pasuk says, V'chai bohem. One has to live by fulfilling the mitzvah. It says, Chas shalom, fulfilling mitzvahs, not eating on Yom Kippur or keeping the Shabbos will call, might, even just might, cause somebody to die, then one sets it aside. HaKadosh Baruch Hu prioritizes life over everything. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves life and that has priority over, over everything. And therefore, it's an absolute obligation for a person if he's threatened by, uh, he has a life-threatening illness, and it's an obligation for him to eat on Yom Kippur. And he doesn't need to worry that he's committing an arbeira, he's eating on Yom Kippur, there's no question about it. He's fulfilling a much more important mitzvah. And in fact, the Chofetz Chaim tells us in Mishra Brura that not only is it not an arbeira, but if somebody would actually fast on Yom Kippur, he would be considered as though he's committing suicide. He, the Chofetz Chaim quotes a pasuk, Va'ach in Parshas Noyach, Va'ach es dimchem lenachshayseichem edroish. God will demand an accounting from somebody who spills his own blood. And the Chofetz Chaim says that's so much somebody who wants to fast from Yom Kippur, he's obligated to do so. So I don't think there's any question that a person, if, if, as, if, he, he is threatened by Chas Vashon, a life-threatening illness. Not only is he allowed to eat, but he must eat on Yom Kippur. It's an absolute mitzvah. Just as a bris on Shabbos, we know we push away the we desecrate Shabbos to fulfill a bris. Nobody would dream of pushing off the bris on Sunday not to desecrate the Shabbos. It's a mitzvah to fulfill the, the bris on Shabbos. So it's a mitzvah for him to save his life and to eat on Yom Kippur. And as we know, Abchaim Soloveitchik, he was once asked, Abchaim, before Yom Kippur, he used to sit, and all, all the people, questionable, they came to him with questions, should they be eating on Yom Kippur? And he was very lenient. If there's slightest doubt, that it's life that we should tell him to eat. And his people around him asked him, why are you being so lenient when it comes to eating on your, fasting on Yom Kippur? And he answered, I, I'm not being lenient. I'm being stringent on the mitzvah of the Chai Bohem. The Chai Bohem is prioritizes, and that's a mitzvah which everybody has. So if a person should, uh, is allowed to eat on Yom Kippur, then he must eat on Yom Kippur. It's completely wrong for him to fast on Yom Kippur. I think, uh, I think that's important to understand. A person must have no regrets about it. If a doctor dictates that he must eat, then he must eat. Okay, so, so two questions. Thank you, uh, Dying Sam. Two questions I have from what you've uh, just uh, said and, and Yasha Koaf. Number one, so it's not an automatic assumption because that you, since you've tested positive that you should be eating, it needs to be that the doctor has said that you should eat. Is that what the Dying said? Yes, absolutely. That's, uh, I, I thought you'd probably lead on to this question. There's no question about it that um, one has to follow medical opinion. It's really a partnership between a medical opinion and the world. But one without the other, one cannot, one cannot give an opinion. Uh, um, the doctor, a medical expert opinion, it's clear from the Gemara, it's clear from Shulchan Aruch, that depends on a medical opinion. And even the medical opinion that one asks, it doesn't necessarily have to be, will I die if I fast? But I think it's a much easier question. If, will eating help me to get out of this life-threatening illness? And once it does, then, 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 um, then one has to eat. But again, it's together with the role, because one has to know what, what, there's many, many halachas concerning asking doctors themselves. Can one ask a, a doctor who's not religious, who doesn't keep Yom Kippur, doesn't understand the importance of Yom Kippur? What happens? if there's a difference of opinion among doctors. But together, once, once it's clear that the doctor feels that he ought to be eating because he's in, he, he's in danger of his life, then yes, absolutely, uh, as we said, he's got an obligation to eat, yeah. 
I, if I may carry on just a little bit, yeah, go on. No, 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 please. Uh, I tell you, um, so having said that, that we just asked Mel Pepin, I've spoken to a few doctors. The, uh, no question that each individual case, every individual person has to ask their own doctor and their own log. But just to give some idea, as a vague idea of, of what might be considered cases, scenarios, where a person should eat a Mel Kippur, I think if somebody's been tested positive, just positive, he, he doesn't feel ill, but he's high risk, he's in a high risk group, or he's got an underlying condition, high blood pressure, then simply Yes, apologies, it must be my internet connection. Um, okay, so if he's been tested positive and he feels okay, he feels well, he, does, he may have lost his taste or smell, he's got small, light symptoms. However, he's in a high risk group or he's got underlying conditions, then the, a, a doctor may well tell him that he ought to eat or at least drink on Yom Kippur. The fact that he's in a high risk, simply having the, the symptoms, although they may be small, but there may well be an argument, a doctor may tell him, uh, he's got high blood pressure, whatever it is, because of the danger that it will get worse, um, he may feel he should be drinking. Drinking, again, one needs a rule because it's, uh, sometimes it's, uh, one can need to drink a minimum share rather than a big share, uh, which although is biblically prohibited, but it's le there's no punishment, of course, so drinking less than a share. So that's one scenario where he feels well, but he's in a high-risk group. Another one, uh, if they feel very ill, so they've been tested positive, and they really feel ill, uh, a doctor may feel that he ought to be drinking on Yom Kippur, possibly eating, but definitely drinking, or he's running a high temperature, or he's short of breath, or such like, um, this might be a reason why a doctor will, uh, will feel that he ought to be uh, eating or definitely drinking on Yom Kippur. But again, each case is an individual case, and each individual has to ask their doctor and speak to their off. Yeah. But it's interesting because somebody who's comp perfectly healthy one could have argued maybe he should also be eating on Yom Kippur in case so that he shouldn't catch this terrible virus is spreading and unfortunately is on the up at the moment. And it's interesting the the Chofetz Chaim in Mishabur brings a tshuva of the Chassam Sofer in the 1850, 1840s when there was a plague. Uh, those who were ill at Yom Kippur and the Chassam Sofer said at that time that even the healthy people should be drinking on Yom Kippur. I think the understanding was that doctors were saying at that time that even healthy people should be healthy, should remain healthy, should be strong, not to catch whatever plague it was. And I think 10 years later, the famous story with Rabbi Saw Salante in Vilna, when there was a cholera outbreak. And then Rabbi Saw Salante was a young man, but he felt that he even healthy people should be drinking. A lot of people resisted. Um, there was, in fact, the Machrekes, uh, uh, was always in Halacha between him and the Bez in Vilna. But he thought even healthy people should drink. He actually went up on the bim on Yom Kippur and he made Kiddush in front of everybody. Yeah. But that was the opinion that um, I don't think today with the, the, this pandemic, which unfortunately we're going through, any doctor would say that a healthy person needs to drink. But again, each case has to be taken on its merits. Right. Well, that's that's very that's very helpful, Diane. Um, and and and, I, and I'd like to just point out to our members and viewers that uh, sometimes you know we one might go for a test because you think you have symptoms, and if you do test positive, it's not always so easy to be able to get hold of a doctor on speed dial. But I do want our members and viewers to know that. Um, I have, and other Rabbanim have um, instant access to, to doctors that we can consult with. Uh, uh, and so please do be in touch with us because like Diane Simons has said, uh, we, uh, it, it's, a, it's something that should be done in consultation between uh, the rabbi and the doctor and, and of course the individual themselves. Uh, so let me ask you, Diane Simons, um, if, someone ha is asymptomatic or they they've, so they've tested positive they're asymptomatic or maybe they have symptoms that are still ongoing like uh, a lack of taste and smell even though they no longer have fever because but it's something that's been lingering uh, is there should they be fasting or should they be consulting with their doctor what what, what approach should one take uh, in coronavirus? 
again, uh, the, I think no question about it, they should be discussing with a doctor. I would have thought that if they're over it, then by fasting, there's no danger of Chas coming back or such like. But um, you know, if they are worried, they should consult with a doctor. As, but again, as long as they feel well, they don't feel ill, they haven't got an underlying condition, they haven't right. got short, a lot short of breath or any way. Um, but at the end of the day, they should consult with a doctor, yes, absolutely. All right, so let's talk about shortness of breath. Uh, you know, most of uh, the minyanim that we have that are taking place indoors, uh, we are wearing masks uh, so that we don't spread the virus. So if someone is worried that by wearing a mask all day, uh, it might bring them to feel faint and, and perhaps need to break their fast, is it better to take the risk and be in sure with the mask knowing that I don't know what the end of the day will bring, or is it better just to stay home and dive in without the mask uh, and know that I'll be able to fast fine? Okay, um, I mean, there's no question about it. Somebody's faced with a choice. Uh, no question, fasting is a biblical obligation. Davening in shul with a minion, with all the thrillers, is still not biblical, and it's uh, much more important that a person fasts. Now, if by coming to shul he feels there's a good chance he's going to feel faint and he'll have to eat, he shouldn't be putting himself in that position. Um, there's no doubt about it. He should stay at home, dabble at home. Uh, if he feels he'll, he'll feel better and is less likely to have to break his fast. I don't think there's a shadow of doubt about that. It's, it's, I mean, this is really applies to other people, people who know that on Yom Kippur they're going to have to eat. Um, certain conditions, if they come to shul, they're going to have to eat more. Because the walking to shul and the doubling in shul, this is every year. Right. And they would have to eat more. There's no question about it. A person should rather double at home every year if he knows that he's going to have to eat. But let's say he's going to have to eat more by coming to shul, break his fast more often because of the, of the uh, exertion of coming to shul, etc. Was, there was a part fill in one of the shuls, I think, a couple of years ago, who, was that, who used to double a shriach symbol for Musa from Yom Kippur. That he would eat, he had unfortunately an underlying illness. Um, he was allowed to eat on Yom Kippur and he would break his fast on Yom Kippur. But I felt it was wrong for him to double as a Shriak Sibro. But no question, by him doubling for the omelet, that would be added exertion. He would have to break his fast more often. And it wasn't right that he should, that, uh, because that, at the end of the day, fasting is a biblical obligation. So I think if he knows there's a good chance he's going to have to break his fast in Shul, he should rather stay at home. The only question will be if it's only a small chance, it might. So one could argue that it's only a small chance he'll feel faint. So for the moment he goes to shul, one ought to go to shul if one can, one darwin's bit civil. And if it comes to it, then uh, I would say it's only, you know, if it's a relatively small chance. But if he thinks it's a 50 50 chance, he may have to break his fast. I would say he should rather dive at home and fast. If he knows that by staying at home, he will be able to fast fully. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we know that, so there are a number of prohibitions on Yom Kippur from fasting to wearing leather shoes. We also don't wash ourselves. We don't even wash our hands uh, on Yom Kippur in the morning, the Negovasa. So now with this pandemic, we know there's, it's all about hand washing. Um, are, is one allowed to wash one's hands on Yom Kippur? Uh, during coronavirus? Um, there's no question, of course, of course he's allowed to. Uh, biblically, Minatera, the only prohibition is to wash yourself for time, not for enjoyment. Uh, to enjoy, to have a shower, or whatever it is, to wash your hands and face for enjoyment, that's biblically prohibited. To wash yourself if you've got dirt on your hands or anywhere on your body, that's perfectly permitted. That the Gemara says, that's perfectly permitted. There is a case in the middle where it's not for enjoyment, but it's not uncomfortable, he's got no dirt on his hand. Then there's a discussion in Shulchan Aruch, the Morgan Avram and the Taz, where it's rabbinically prohibited. And the Chatchela, one doesn't wash oneself unless there's dirt, some dirt on his hand or such like. Uh, but the, 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 the Mishnah Bura says the, the halacha, the, the correct halacha is, of course, strict halacha, one is permitted as long as it's not for enjoyment. Enjoyment is biblically prohibited. If it's not for enjoyment, it's permitted um, So I would say that in this case, if sanit sanitizing, which is important, and it's not for enjoyment, no question about it, 
plus the added point that we're worried of spreading this terrible virus. And if it's, if it's for that reason, then, that, then that's permitted. The only thing one has to think about whether it's sufficient just to wash the fingers, to sanitize the fingers, as one have to sanitize the whole, the whole hand. But whatever one, one is doing for the health reasons, no question about it, it's uh, permitted, even rabbinically, there's no, um, that, that's absolutely permitted. Is, is there any preference between using um, soap and water versus hand sanitizer from a halakhic perspective? No, that would be the same as Shabbos, uh, every Shabbos, uh, as long as it's liquid, like it's not actually sicha, um, rubbing, rubbing like a thick, um, as long as it's fairly fluid, it's liquidy, that's absolutely fine. And there's no difference to any Shabbos, is, uh, which, which one doesn't. We do it every Shabbos, we wash our hands with it. Um, so that, no, it's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But again, one, if the intention is purely to um, hand wash it because of, the, because of what we're going through this year, that's absolutely, yeah. then it's fine, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, I want to say Yashikov to the Basin and to the office and to the Chief Rabbi for um, maintaining our uh, women's mikveh uh, throughout the pandemic. I know that in some countries um, it, it wasn't, they weren't able to, and this is one of the fundamentals of, of Judaism, uh, for women to, uh, married women to uh, go to the mikveh um, on a monthly basis. For men, um, the prevalent custom seems to be um, Arab Yom Kippur, that men go to the mikveh, uh, I know that since it's just a custom, uh, many of the, or probably most of the men's mikvahs are, remain closed. Um, are there other options such as the men's pond at Hampstead Heath? Okay, um, there's probably two options. One is, as you say, a pond, a uh, men's pond at Hampstead Heath. It, it is questionable the halacha whether it is a kosher mikvah. I mean, as far as uh, women immersing, there's no question that will never be permitted in a pond. It's a complicated subject, mikvahs. But the um, question is where the water is coming from. Is it from under the ground or is it from rain? If it's coming from rivers, is it flowing? It's not clear where the water in Hampstead I'm, I'm not clear where the water in Hampstead Heath is coming from, um, whether it's a spring is coming from underneath. But there are halakhi problems and one would never permit a woman to immerse in a pond or in a river for that matter. Um, but as far as the custom of, of um, immersing on Erev Yom Kippur, I think it's fine to immerse in Hampstead Heath. Having said that, um, I'm not sure what the health, I mean the, the McCoy's today, those that are open have chlorine in them. I think they're the COVID safe. I'm not sure about Hampstead Heath, whether which one's safer. So that's one option. That is one option. Which the other one is the Ramah brings that if somebody can't immerse in a mikvah on Yom Kippur, then he should pour what he calls nine kav, the Gemara in Brachas. It's a volume of nine kav of water over him. Uh, how does that apply nowadays? I mean, nine kav, the volume of nine kav, I think the possibly says just under 22 liters of water. How on earth are you going to get 22 liters for 22 liters of water over you? But many possibly say under a shower, if a person stands under a shower, uh, without, in one go, he leaves it on. Now, how long it ha he has to leave on depends on the pressure, the volume of his shower. But um, I would say an average shower is probably about five minutes under the mikvah, under the shower, five minutes under the shower. It can be warm water, it can be hot water, but without, without with no breaks in one, in, uh, five minutes in one go, is fulfilling the, rabbinic, the certain times the Chachomim uh, permitted this to four nine cap, for instance, well, it's a certain cases my Brochus talks about, but the remorse says it in the area of Kippur, that if somebody can't immerse in a mikvah, then he should pour nine cup, which I think with our modern day showers is feasible. And, and that would be, so is there no halakhic advantage of going to the pond over the nine cup of the shower? It's hard to know. If, I would say probably nine cup is better because I'm not convinced that the that uh, Hansen Heath is a kosher mikvah. Okay. Uh, when we were at the height of, uh, of this pandemic Pesach time, I mean, throughout the world, the men's mikvahs were closed. And there, all the Rabbonim uh, all over the world were saying to do this uh, nine cup for men. For women, it would never have helped, of course. And uh, oh, Hashem, most mikvahs throughout the world, they managed to keep open. But for men, it's absolutely fine to do this nine cup. I would say 22 liters, but uh, I would say on average about five or six minutes 
on the side. Okay, excellent, excellent. And I, I might remind our uh, members and viewers that um, e before Pesach, even our Kalim mikvahs were closed and we had to rely on all sorts of leniencies. They are now open again. Uh, one can go to, to Monks and Golders Green and um, immerse any utensils that um, one uh, couldn't uh, in the past. Um, here, here in the suburb, there is a men's mikvah, but at the moment, it's not open to anyone outside the yeshiva. Uh, it's only open to the yeshiva bathroom because they are a bubble. Uh, but thank you, Diane Simons, for giving us that um, heter uh, to be able to use the nine cov during during coronavirus. Um, are there other issues this year that the Diane uh, wants to share with our viewers? Is a uh, different due to coronavirus that we should be, be aware of? During this high holiday season, as we approach Sukkot, uh, Simchas Torah, Hoshanas, uh, other things we need to know. Um, I think uh, nothing I can think of. And some one love did ask me from uh, from a shul where they build a sukkah every year in the courtyard behind their shul. It's got four walls to it uh, with a schach on top. And they, f and they felt that to make it COVID safe, it would be nice to leave it open, um, maybe not put up all the walls. Um, so I told them this morning, absolutely. Uh, biblically, one, it, uh, one can be so one fulfills a mitzvah with two walls and seven tvachim, and even rabbinically. The remark does say that one should try and be surrounded by all four walls if one can. But I think for those building a mikvah, um, excuse me, a sukkah, in a um, for the for the for the community where everybody's going to use it, I think keeping open as much as possible. So it can get complicated. One must discuss it with the Rob exactly how it's to be built. This two and a half walls, but um, but I think that uh, that's absolutely fine. Rabbi, Fel, Rabbi Friedman, what are you doing for Simchas Torah? You you thought ahead. Yes, I mean, we're thinking about Simchas Torah and uh, you know we have the markings. I mean, I guess the first question will be the Hoshanas. Uh, and the markings of the shul, we have everything around the bim are marked in two meter separations. And it's a matter of spacing people and taking turns. And, you know, I mean, there can't, there's no singing in shul, so maybe some of it would have to take place outside. I, I was even toying with the idea. I hope I'm not overstepping now before I discuss this with my warden. But when it comes to the dancing, you know, maybe we need ropes that are two meters long and people to hold on so that they're nowhere near one another. So we can do, there's nothing um, wrong with dancing and singing if it's outside as long as we're maintaining that social distance. And if we can find ways to, yeah. to make that happen, you know, that's probably what we yeah. should be doing. I think like yeah. uh, you know, the flip side of what Diane Simon said earlier about being machmir in Pekach Nefesh versus being makel in in eating, I think we, we have to be machmir as well. We, you know, we're being machmir in the, uh, in, in Pekach Nefesh, but we also have to be machmir in the Ruchnius and figure out ways that we can be creative uh, and not simply say, well, we can't do it the way we always do it, so let's just um, not do it. You know, there are ways that we can find yeah. to be able to make it happen. Absolutely, absolutely. When there's a world, there's a way. I think it's worth mentioning also those people who are feeling unwell over Sukkot, um, and they, they find it difficult to eat in a sukkah. A chola doesn't have to be life-threatening. Right. One lives in a sukkah like one lives at home. So if somebody's ill, uh, but uh, we're, um, you know, with a little bit of temperature, even if it's not major, they're potter from sukkah. But, um, Especially as it gets colder <laughs> by that time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Although, although I must say... Um, in the time, one has to be very careful with... Yeah, I mean, here, I, I don't know if anybody even knows what cold is. You know, when we lived in Canada, there was one year that we had to take a foot of snow off the schach before sukkahs began. But there's a Ramah. The Ramah talks about it. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Diane Simons, for your time. Wish you a good Gebenz uh, Jar. And may, may next year, 5781, be better for the entire world. Please, Thank God, you. let me wish you and your family and your community and please, God, we'll have a good year this year. Amen.
So that was quite interesting. You know, one should actually know that if um, wearing the mask is going to be, it makes you really thirsty. And so if, if that's going to be an issue for you not fasting, you should stay at home in Daven um, and, and not come to Shul. What I've done sometimes when the service is long, just go outside for a few minutes, get a mm. fresh of breath air and come back right. in. Right. Yeah. Because it's definitely going to be a different experience. While Rosh Hashanah was amazing and it was wonderful, um, even with the masks, um, Yom Kippur is, is going to be an extra challenge of, yeah. of not being able to drink. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I guess we'll see how it goes and everybody will play by ear. But uh, definitely yeah. you have that heter to now, you know, to, to stay home once again, yeah. um, if need be. So thank you for that. And now, um, you know, many of you have seen the Freilich family uh, with Hazan Avrami do the Thursday night. Uh, yeah, and Moshe the waiter. The Moshe the waiter, <laughs> that's right, with a different simanim, um, preparing us for Rosh Hashanah. So we have a little, uh, uh, we took a little t- uh, t- a clip from it, um, the which we also say right. for Yom Kippur, for you to get into that mode. And I... I know they're doing something special again this Thursday night um, to prepare us for Yom Kippur. So we look forward to seeing that. And um, so we'll leave you with that uh, little prayer that comes from the heart, right? We know that Hashem is always here, always around, and it's up to us to really uh, tap into that. Tap into that, yeah. you know? I mean, I think a lot of us think that, oh, you know, He won't hear us. Will He go- answer our prayers? And I think, you know, one, in one of the prayer books, I think it was the H that said, Rabbi Rowe has, says that, you know, it's, uh, it's not about God changing his mind when we pray. It's about us changing our ways, us yeah. being able to change our and then get into well. outlook. Yeah. So, um, so with that, let's hear uh, Chazan Rami. Yeah, and then we'll, le- we'll leave you with that. So from us here at the studio, we wish you Shana Tava, Gemar Chasima Taiva, and a git gebench to yours this end of this. Maybe you inscribed yeah. in the book of, in, and sealed in, yeah. the, in the book of life. Um, and only good things have easy fast. And may we have a better year. Our main, our main for all of us. Thank you. If you don't know how to pray, you can of course pray with your heart. Those should come before God. Achila Lakel, what a beautiful song. No, 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 no.